My name is Julian Shannon. I'm a geophysical data scientist here at Blueware. I'm excited to have our CEO here at Blueware, Dan Piet, and he'll be talking about Energy 4.0 or Industry 4.0. We're entering a new age of digitalization. So, Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I am an engineer by degree, a mining engineer, and I've worked for 10 companies in my career. The first one was Exxon, right out of school as a mining engineer. But after that, I've worked for technology companies, nine different technology companies. Each one of them was introducing new technology to oil and gas. Something as simple as computer-aided economic analysis or computer-aided mapping, things that were new at the time, but today we take, we take for granted. Um, of those nine companies, I was CEO of five of them. Oh, wow. And okay. So I've had a lot of experience going through this and growing companies. And I can tell you, and I have told everybody that I know this, this is the best company I've ever worked for. We have the best people, we have the best technology, and I think that we've the sky's the limit for us right now. Well, that's exciting. It's also comforting because my, me, myself, working at Bloor, I love it here, and I'm not being forced to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun here, but that's amazing. So you really had a breadth of experience throughout all sorts of different industries, but also applying that technology. That's right. And so what we're seeing a lot of today is sort of this buzz about the cloud, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that the cloud is going to give this new opportunity to energy companies that are facing these new challenges to increase efficiencies but also lower their costs? Ultimately, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Every time a new technology is introduced to the energy industry, initially there's a little bit of pushback as people right. say, I don't want to spend the money, I don't want to learn something new. But then they start to embrace it and you can see a big change in the productivity of the people that are involved. I can see it so clearly from the cloud in that historically what we've done is we've always moved the data to the applications or the data to the computer. You had a person working on a laptop or maybe working on remotely, and every time they needed more information, they would download it to their computer. I see, yeah. Kind of just pulling that. Pulling that data down. Mm -hmm. Now, however, with things like OSDU and different standards bodies, we can put all that data in the cloud, and now the applications go to the cloud. So the data stays in one place, which is tremendously important, just right. because the data is so huge. Right, exactly. And there's all sorts of different scales. We're talking <clears throat> maybe something as small as well logs, but mm -hmm. then we have these large, massive 3D volumes that mm -hmm. take up a significant amount of space, almost more than the storage of a physical hard drive. Exactly, right. and, that, and that's what you see. You can't afford to keep adding disks. Right. You, you, you have to have the ability to expand sort of on somebody else's capital. And that's what we see how the cloud is so valuable right now in terms of being able to deliver that sort of, uh, that sort of value to the oil companies and to any end user who needs it. Right, and so we're talking about all of these, you know, you can't add more hard drives. So that kind of brings to the next thing about scalability. Mm -hmm. And so the cloud really enables that, right? Absolutely, and and that's the other thing that we've, we've talked about in the past. If you look at a couple of other technologies that are, are allowing us to do this, you can think of the standards, OSDU, things like that, that are right. kind of prosaic. I mean, you think about a plug, and you know that if you take a plug and go into any wall socket, it's going to work. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a tremendous important thing. And, and think about if that's how your data would work. Up until now, it hasn't. You had to get data in your own format. Mm -hmm. If you're running on you know, software company A, you had to reformat the data to for software company A, download it and take all that time. But now everybody can use, can use the same format. Right. So you can go in there, do your interpretation, understand what's going on, and I always like to describe interpretation as building a story. It what, is. what actually happened there? What was the depositional environment, right? right. What was the, the what, what subductions happened in order to get down, that down? What were the thermal maturations you saw? If all you're doing is drawing lines, it doesn't give you a chance to think about that. Right. And then with a standards-based, you can, everybody can share that same information. So you as a geologist mm -hmm. might look at something different than me as an engineer. But we can collaborate on the same data and say, ah, now I understand. And when you understand, that's how you find oil. Another piece of the technology that we see that's making a difference right now is the use of artificial intelligence. Right. And we've talked about artificial intelligence for many, many, many years. I mean, you know, I think the phrase was coined in the 1950s. You probably know it better right. than me. Right? Yeah. Because you were around. <laughs> and, but we, right. we, we see the, the goalpost has always been changing. I think if you look at the way people use 
airplanes, you know, autopilot. Autopilot today would absolutely have been called artificial intelligence 20 years ago. But now it's just a, a controls-based system. Right. And so we're starting to use these technologies to come up and help us build these stories we talked about earlier. So now we have the cloud, we have faster computers, we have artificial intelligence. And we, we here at Blueware never lose sight of the fact that what we're trying to do is help people find oil and gas. Exactly. It, yeah. it isn't just, I want to have a really cool algorithm, right? I want to have a really cool way to, to, to spend my time on my data. It's really understanding what's going on in the subsurface so mm -hmm. you can pick a location. Exactly. What? How can I improve the time between understanding what's going on to putting an X and Y location on my well? Exactly. And using a combination of all these different technologies, right, AI and cloud computing, it's able to accelerate that process. I just learned something today in our, our daily staff meeting. Uh, one of our clients is taking the output from our product right. and sending that directly to the drillers. Wow. I don't even know if you've heard that yet. No, this is yeah, this <laughs> yeah. is new. <laughs> and so this is this is really short circuiting the the cycle time in order to get to a point where you can start to drill a well, which is really the whole thing. You know, reduce the cycle time, reduce the risk, and lower cost. Exactly, and especially reducing the risk, and that's kind of amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Using interactive AI, which was originally geared as a geoscience tool, right? But now it's actually being applied in the drilling space, yes. and really, it, it's it's collaborative in its own yes. sense. It's a, that's absolutely true. So then, that's really fantastic. Um, kind of bringing it back to a different perspective, what about the sustainability space when using those drilling programs? That's a real interesting perspective as well because we've done some studies here to understand what the costs are of drilling a dry hole in terms of carbon. And on average, and of course it's a, it's a broad number, on average, a typical dry hole will generate about a million and a half kilograms of CO2. Wow. So if you can think of eliminating a couple of dry holes a year, that really does affect the carbon footprint of the drilling company, of the company, and anything that can reduce carbon is good for us in the long run. Right, that's huge. And actually, we're also seeing a different application of AI as well for the subsurface. It's not just for these petroleum programs, but we're also seeing it for uh, geothermal opportunities, for CCS opportunities. It's still characterizing the subsurface. It's just looking at it from a different perspective. That's really true. One of our clients called up and they said, we want to be able to use your software when we're looking for shallow hazards as we're building wind turbine bases. It's really hard for them to do that right now, but using our tools, you right. can immediately understand where you might have to move the base of that wind turbine in order to avoid any sort of problems as you're building them on the, on the ocean bottom. Absolutely, and it really goes back to that scale because you're characterizing the whole subsurface. Okay. So now it impacts how you're going to, in, to install those turbines at scale. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan, thank you again. It's been <laughs> really insightful. I mean, I learned a lot talking with you, learning from you, and also as well as working with you. So we appreciate you. And we're glad to have you here, Julian. It's always fun. Always fun. Thanks for stopping okay. by. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. If you learned something today, be sure to let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you.